you ever have one of those nights when you go to bed knowing that you gotta wake up early, but instead of simply just falling asleep, you fall down some weird rabbit hole online? Like for example, I don't know, maybe Googling every entry in all of the different Pokemon icebergs that you can find? And from doing that, somehow you end up on these Reddit threads that like don't have an ending no matter how long you scroll. But at the same time, you sort of don't want it to end because you've been reading into fan theories for like three hours and you're so invested at this point. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but I will tell you exactly why we're gathered here today. I found so many different iceberg entries scattered across like YouTube videos, Reddit posts, I think page 18 of Google at one point. So, like the gentleman I am, I decided I would take all of my favorite theories and research them a step further. And that turned into me writing a Google Doc with I think like 11,000 words in it. And that Google Doc turned into whatever this abomination is that you're watching now. Also known as the definitive, the ultimate, the best of the best Pokemon iceberg. But maybe don't put too much weight on that title as these are just my favorite entries and I'm sure there's a few fan theories that you've already heard, but of course I'm hoping there's a few you haven't. So, starting with the lightest and probably most well known, and progressively getting, well, consistently worse as we dive deeper into the video, you know, sort of like how an iceberg works. <laughs> But anyways, now, sit back, grab some cream corn, maybe a glass of milk with some ice in it, and let's get started. Lavender Town. Lavender Town embodied horror as good as it possibly could have for a game released in 1996. The story of this town is shrouded in mystery, surrounding a Marowak that was killed by Team Rocket. Upon arriving, the player is tasked with climbing the tower, being home to a Pokemon graveyard, filled with trainers mourning their lost Pokemon. But while this in itself was spooky, the creepy creepypasta that was born from Lavender Town takes a significantly darker turn. As the hoax of Lavender Town Syndrome was born, this stemmed from the soundtrack created by Junichi Masada, and rumor has it that the Lavender Town soundtrack awakened some sleeper cell in children's minds, causing them to, at worst, unalive themselves, but also causing them to complain of things like severe nausea and migraines, and exhibit irrational behavior. This syndrome was allegedly attributed to the high sound frequencies found within the soundtrack that could only be heard by children, and probably like dogs too. And as a grown man reading this creepypasta to you, I can genuinely say that for many years of my childhood, this was one theory that I actually thought was real. It gained so much popularity that it just seemed like a well-known piece of lore within the Pokemon franchise. But the reason that I chose to start off with this specific entry is that it was really this entry that paved the way for so many more to come. Giving life to a darker side of Pokemon and allowing imaginations to just run wild. Green Shiny Pokemon Shiny Pokemon are rare variants of Pokemon that are differently colored than other Pokemon of their species. If you're feeling lucky, you've got a 1 in 8192 chance of stumbling upon one, meaning that ultimately the majority of casual players are unlikely to ever cross one in their journey. Some have incredible variations, and some are so dog shit you probably wouldn't even be able to tell them apart from the original had I not told you that they were shiny. But no form of shiny is more widely despised than the infamous mustard green shinies that lurk among us. There are well over 100 green shiny Pokemon, ranging from a neon green so bright it could blow your eyeballs clean out of their sockets, to a honey mustard relish mix so unappealing that if I ever did find one in the wild, I would probably just smile and nod and continue to walk past it. The alleged reason behind the seemingly never-ending horror of ugly shiny Pokemon is said to have been due to an algorithmic sort that hand-picked the colors that a shiny variation would be given. This is said to be the reason behind the shiny variations of Pokemon like Gengar or Garchomp that are virtually the exact same color. But as the franchise switched to 3D in X and Y, Shinies began being intentionally designed. So that would explain why Mega Gengar introduced in Gen 6 looks the way that it does, and of course regular Gengar looks the way that it does. <laughs> But that explanation didn't really suffice, as the game's codebase never showed anything regarding a shiny picking algorithm. However, at one point, a color editing tool containing three variations was pulled from the debug menu in gold and silver, almost providing concrete evidence that these horrors among us were actually man-made. Because if not, why would an editing tool be required if these colors were just going to be generated by some sort of algorithm regardless? 
Clefable's Shadow. Since Pokemon's conception, fans have picked up on the striking similarities that exist between Gengar and Clefable. On the surface, it's not really there. But if you solely look at these two Pokemon from a design perspective, these two share almost identical bodies, arms, legs, and ears. Hair and tail being the only defining characteristics that really set these two apart. So now from this, it's theorized that Gengar could be Clefable's Shadow. Outside of being known as the Shadow Pokemon, and its name supposedly being derived from the word doppelganger, meaning the ghostly double of a person. There's also polarizing Pokedex entries to support this theory, with Clefable's Pokemon Red and Blue entry reading, a timid fairy Pokemon that is rarely seen. It will run and hide the moment it senses people. While Gengar's reads a much different, under a full moon, this Pokemon likes to mimic the shadows of people and laugh at their fright. It's known canonically that ghost-type Pokemon like to feed on the life force of unsuspecting victims, which would essentially leave Clefable to be haunted eternally by its own shadow. Missing No. Missing No is by far the most well-known glitch Pokemon associated with the games. This creature is an unofficial Pokemon species that can be found in red and blue. By first watching the old man's catch demonstration in Viridian City, then flying to Cinnabar Island, and surfing up and down the coast until you eventually encounter it. By following this specific series of events, the player somehow disrupts the game's random encounter system and forces the system to generate a Pokemon with an invalid identifier, causing Missing no to appear as a hybrid bird normal type Pokemon. Missing No is also known to appear in several forms, the most iconic being the purple and orange L shape that's commonly referenced when describing the Pokemon. But it also comes in the form of a roadkill Blaziken, a Lavender Town Ghost, or a Kabutops or Aerodactyl Fossil Sprite. While encountering Missing No causes some graphic anomalies throughout the game, such as completely fucking breaking the Hall of Fame, catching Missing No also has its effects, as this changes gameplay by increasing the number of items in the sixth entry of a player's inventory by 128. This has obviously led to such things as rare candy exploits. It was kind of like running action replay moves before that thing ever existed. It's now said that Missing No is the most famous glitch among video games to date, but this isn't really a bad thing. This glitch itself was covered in things such as strategy guides and magazines at the time of its discovery, and it's still thought to have played a massive role in increasing the game's popularity. Ash's Coma the infamous coma theory pretty much surrounds every single anime or related series in some way. It's become like the modern day version of finishing your essay with, and it was all a dream. But Ash's coma has become such a cult classic at this point, I just felt rude passing it over. In the first episode of the anime, Ash can be seen just eating shit on his back and then getting shocked by his companion, Pikachu. This is said to have been what sent Ash into this deep, dark, Coma. The theory states that every episode after this is nothing more than his imagination running wild in a comatose state, giving reason as to why he never ages within the series. <laughs> At its core, this theory is nothing more than just like some lazy uninspired fan theory among a million other coma theories. I absolutely hate these, but I felt like we had to cover them. The Ho-Oh Immortality Theory in the very first episode of the Pokemon anime, Ash sees the legendary Pokemon Ho-Oh fly above him as he stares in awe. But what's peculiar about this being put on display in the first episode actually comes from the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl Pokedex entry for Ho-Oh. And that entry reads, Ho-Oh possesses seven colored wings, and it's said that those who see Ho-Oh are promised eternal happiness. The popular theory behind Ash seeing Ho-Oh in the first episode is rooted in the idea that Ash's version of eternal happiness lies in the worry-free life of an explorative 10-year-old. However, many people dispute this as the series actually revolves around Ash's journey to become the best Pokemon trainer of all time, something that a 10-year-old would potentially face difficulties in doing, and this entire theory being based off of one individual entry in an unrelated Pokedex seems like a bit of a stretch. But another thing that I've heard, those who see Ho-Oh when watching a Pokemon Iceberg video are more likely to subscribe, so hey, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> do it now, subscribe, do it now. Now, Mew is a failed Ditto clone. Mew being a failed Ditto clone is one of the theories on this list that actually has evidence to back it up, making it one of the more believable theories that I was able to find. While many people deem it to be untrue, the similarities are kind of hard to combat at this point. Allow me to explain. Both Ditto and Mew weigh exactly 8.8 .8 pounds, both of which have no gender, and these are the only two Pokemon who can learn the move Transform from level 1. This is incredibly rare, considering that only two Pokemon in the entire universe can 
actually learn this move. Even Zorark's illusion ability, while similar to what Transform can do, is still leagues below how incredible this power actually is. On top of all of this, Ditto has two specific spawn locations, Cerulean Cave and the Pokemon Mansion. This carries significance because Mewtwo was cloned from Mew within the Pokemon Mansion. From there, it fled to Cerulean Cave where it made the cave its home. So with all this in mind, it's thought that at one point, Ditto was to be some sort of Mew or Mewtwo clone, but obviously this idea was scrapped in production, leaving only a breadcrumb trail of a connection that could have been. The almost imposter oak. Imposter Oak refers to a trading card in which Professor Oak is depicted in a much cooler and villainized way. And that was about as much as we knew about Imposter Oak, until 2018 when the Space World dump had been released. Something we'll be diving into in greater detail if you don't already know what it is. But anyways, when this data came to the surface, inside an Imposter Oak sprite was scraped from the data, and it's thought that Imposter Oak was to be a key villain at some point in the game before being scrapped. So now all we have left is the card and the thought of what could have been. Hypno belongs behind bars. This theory was kickstarted from the Fire Red Pokedex entry, which states, Hypno carries a pendulum-like device. There was once an incident in which it took away a child it hypnotized. This led fans to believe that Hypno had less than good intentions involving its hypnosis powers. And just in case that singular entry wasn't bad enough, Pokemon had doubled down with the release of their Sleeper 097 shirt. This shirt depicted a Hypno sporting his pendulum, leading to FBI, leading two children, FBI get here now, leading two children away by hand. Since this depiction, fan theories have absolutely run wild in every way you could possibly imagine. And really, like, can you blame them? And the majority of these theories are bordering the truth. As in Sun and Moon, you can also find a journal entry written in a notebook, describing a situation where Hypno was picking up a new kid at the school? So, hey dude, go to prison. The Lost Space World Media In 1997, an early build demo of the game's Pokemon Gold and Silver had been shown at Nintendo's Space World from November 21st to 23rd. At this point in time, the game was estimated to be about 80% complete, and it was set to be released in the coming months. However, due to various delays, including a complete overhaul of the game, it didn't end up being released until 99, leaving these demos to perish along with the abandoned ideas and Pokemon displayed in the demo. Very little was known about this demo, due to the majority of the game being locked off from player access. The only thing that was really left behind that could vouch for its existence were a few photos of the event and the memories from those who had actually gotten their hands on the demo at the time of Space World. However, on May 26, 2018, that all changed, when an anonymous user dumped these demos, allowing players to explore the data that was blocked off at the time of Space World. And much of what was blocked off to the player was widely unfinished anyways, but that doesn't mean some gems weren't discovered in the process. Over 100 never before seen sprites of various Pokemon had been recovered. And it's funny to look over these and think about what actually could have came from this. Spinda doubles. You all know Spinda, right? Of course you do, it's everyone's 905th favorite Pokemon. But hey, come on. Even though Spinda might not have an evolution, or a single good stat, and while we're at it, seemingly any redeeming traits at all, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of cool that each and every Spinda that you see in the wild is sporting its own unique pattern. There's a random generation of over 4,294,967,296 possible outcomes for the pattern on a Spinda. And the odds of two people discovering the same pattern on a Spinda, but in a shiny form, are over 8 billion to 1. Sort of like the odds of anyone actually liking Spinda. Meaning to this day, there are probably billions of undiscovered Spindas just waiting to be discovered. But they probably won't be because who's looking? The Great Pokemon War. The Great Pokemon War, or the Kanto War, is a fan theory stemming from the gym leader of Vermilion City, LT Surge. When you first encounter Surge in Vermilion City, he speaks of how electric Pokemon saved his life during the war. But he never elaborates or really gives any further explanation on the topic. But in a world where children go out on great adventures, most adults you meet are either gym leaders or involved in organized crime, fans have started to come to the conclusion that the lack of young to middle-aged adults could allude to the fact that there was a massive war that took place in Kanto or involved a large portion of the population of Kanto. This idea caught some wind due to the fact that a lot of players in the game seem overly paranoid.
paranoid, as well as you, the main character, not having a father, and your rival being an orphan. While this theory has many branches that it can stem into, it always returns to LT Surge's initial statement. Bikini Balls In Pokemon Black and White, when painfully trying to avoid those swimmer battles, if you encounter the right swimmer, you might learn something new about Pokeball storage in the world of Pokemon. Upon being challenged by the swimmer, she will say, if I'm wearing a bikini, where do I put my Pokeballs? Woman's secret. This is even doubled down on later in the series. In Sun and Moon, when encountering a swimmer, she will say, it's tough fetching Pokeballs from my bikini. While maybe not a creepy entry in the series, you still can't deny that this is weirdly uncharacteristic for a Pokemon game to include things of this nature. Okay, you know what? Maybe fucking not, actually. The Hex Maniac Ghost. It's no secret that X and Y had their share of creepy stuff taking place. But for years, fans have been stumped by the presence of a hex maniac who resides in Lumio City. You can find this ghost when entering the second floor of the office building. The lights will flicker and the hex maniac model will appear behind the player. Upon entering, the ghost will hover in front of you until she's about to exit the screen, but leaving one last message before she does. No. You're not the one. Pretty strange message to have coded into the game with no further explanation. But thanks to this ghost, many theories have been given life, such as this being an unauthorized implementation built by a developer working on the game. But that theory never gained much traction, as fans have suspected this hex maniac could have potentially appeared multiple times. If you visit the fourth floor of the hotel in Lumio City, you'll also find an identical character model, which doesn't necessarily mean it's the same person, although bearing a striking resemblance in the words that she speaks. If prompted, this new hex maniac will say, don't talk to me. If you do, I can't hear the elevator. The unknown character even makes a cameo in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, where you can find this alleged ghost girl hanging out in a cemetery. This theory was kind of hard to find information on, so if anyone has any like updated information regarding it, please feel free. Comment below. Comment below anyways. Tell me how you're doing. Mew 3. Much like the infamous Xbox 720 and the beloved PS4 prototype, it turns out that Mew 3 is nothing but something we all just kind of heard once and then forgot about. With Pokemon like Mew and Mewtwo being around for ages, it's not a surprise that fans would speculate on one day laying their eyes on something as mythical as Mew 3. But in all honesty, <laughs> that might be something that you'll regret. Although Mew 3 has never made an appearance in any of the games, Mew 3 was actually once featured in the Pokemonster manga. After a Clefairy's DNA is merged with that of a Mewtwo, we finally got to see something much scarier than anything you'd find in Lavender Town. And of course, that would be Mew 3. So next time you're tweeting and you're hoping for some new information regarding Mew 3, maybe turn your attention towards like Mew 4 or 5 and hope that we just skip this one all together. Illegal and Banned Pokemon. Illegal Pokemon refer to a list of Pokemon that are not allowed to enter into competitive battles or tournaments. And for some reason, Hypno isn't on this list. That's the FBI's most wanted list. This list, however, consists of legendary mascots and event Pokemon, but there's also a list of banned Pokemon cards. Now, usually, these cards get banned from the TCG due to overpowered strategies, but that isn't the case for a few banned cards. Some are outright banned due to their offensive artwork, such as Misty's Tears or this Grimer. Bro, what are you doing? Illegal Pokemon are also known as hacked or glitched Pokemon, in which players can be banned. If your punk ass is found using them in battle or trading them in online play. So if you've still got that Game Shark or Action Replay kicking around, make sure you flush it down the toilet right now FBI, before. Open up! Kabutops x Genesect. There's a long time theory floating around that the Pokemon Kabutops and Genesect are somehow loosely related to one another. Despite the obvious physical similarities, it's actually what lies in the Pokedex that draws fans to believe that there's more to the relationship between these two than we think. Kabutops previous evolution Pokedex entry reads, it is thought to have inhabited beaches 300 million years ago. It is protected by a stiff shell. While Genesect's entry reads an eerily similar, this Pokemon Pokemon existed 300 million years ago. Team Plasma altered it and attached a cannon to its back. With the Pokedex entry linking these two back to the same time period and the physical similarities, I don't know, pretty convincing. However, it was argued that due to the fact that Kabutops is a rock type Pokemon while Genesect is a bug steel, it doesn't really make sense. But based on looks alone, Kabutops was most likely a bug slash water type Pokemon, with the fossilization of its species being what actually caused the bug 
to rock type transformation. So with all of this in mind, it would make a lot of sense to say that Genesect is actually nothing more than a genetically altered Kabutops. Leave a comment on this one, I actually want to know what everybody thinks. Pokemon for dinner. This is a theory that's been around since Pokemon first arrived on the scene. The dark and ghastly backstory of Pokemon being hunted and the predator-prey relation of Pokemon in the wild. But the bone-chilling reality is that, I mean, yeah, animals eat each other in real life too. However, it's hard to call this entry a theory when several Pokemon are canonically known for being hunted down, sold on the black market, or for just simply being downright delicious. In the anime, it's referenced by Professor Oak that he would have eaten Gary's Krabby over Ash's due to the size of it. Our good pal Appleton is known for having the flesh on his back chomped off by children. That's a real Pokedex entry. And in case you forgot, there's an entire plot line dedicated to Team Rocket selling Slowpoke tails, as they're supposedly one of the most sought after meals in the land. And maybe if you're having one of those, you could wash it down with some of Shuckle's bodily fluids. But outside of simply just eating these Pokemon, the poaching and hunting of Pokemon is also known to be true. Gabite scales can be ground up and used in medicinal powder, and for the love of God, we can only hope that Gabite actually sheds these scales from time to time. Otherwise, the nod can be taken that humans are known to hunt and slay these things in the name of scientific discovery, so hey, it's okay. But other Pokemon, like Sharpedo for example, have almost gone extinct due to the overfishing or hunting of the species in order to sell the dorsal fin. As just like that slippery slowpoke tail, this was considered an elite delicacy. Relicanth is a map. In Pokemon Emerald, it's known that to catch the legendary Regis, you need to be coming correct. And this means having a big, girthy Waylord in the front of your party, and an ancient Relicanth filling up that caboose. And once you begin to run train and search for the Regis, it's said that the Relicanth acts as a map of Hoenn, used to unveil exactly where one or all of these Regis could be hiding. The Regis being as old as dirt, and Relicanth somehow being older, is just a testament that kind of adds to the belief of this theory. Mindy's Haunter. In Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, there is a rotten old bitch offering to trade your Metacam for her Haunter. On the surface, this is an incredible deal. If you're a veteran of the series, then you probably already know that Haunter is only known to evolve by trade, so this essentially guarantees you a Gengar. But upon making the deal with Mindy, you might notice something strange. When this Haunter arrives, it's still a Haunter. Upon finalizing this trade, Mindy will laugh and ask if her Haunter had turned into something else, before saying, Saying, just kidding bro <laughs> and telling you that she actually made it hold something to prevent evolution an everstone and simply by doing this mindy has gained the opposite of a cult following a deep cult hatred with the subreddit r slash fuck mindy garnering over 20,000 users glitch city Glitch City is a map loading glitch that can be accessed through Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. Glitch City can be accessed by following a plethora of steps that involve going in and out of the Safari Zone, saving, restarting the game, emailing me your credit card details, and a few others. But once you've arrived inside Glitch City, it's a bit of a visual dumpster fire. The terrain consists of random combinations of whatever 8x8 pixel tiles happen to be in memory. So sometimes this ends up being like text characters and random bits of terrain. Walking too far in any direction will completely crash the game because once inside, essentially you're in a corrupted copy of an otherwise normal game map. Meaning that walking too far in one direction would essentially lead you to start walking through walls, thus exiting the map boundaries and breaking the game. But it's best to err on the side of caution when entering Glitch City, as the only way to exit is to have a Pokemon that knows Fly on your team. And if you save inside Glitch City without a Pokemon in your party that knows Fly, You'll be trapped for all eternity, unless you erase your save file. Beneath the Mimikyu's Rag Mimikyu is a small Pokemon whose body resides underneath a musty old Pikachu rag, only leaving what is to be considered the fringe of a foot or a lower body visible underneath. And while we both sit here wondering what lies underneath, that's actually an answer we both might not want. According to the Sun Pokedex entry, a scholar who once saw what lied underneath this rag was overwhelmed by terror and died from shock. But that's not the only reported case. It's also known that a gust of wind had revealed what lies underneath to a trainer passing by, who later went home and died painfully that night. But Pokedex entries aside, these two are not the only ones to see what's underneath the cloth. 
In the anime, Meowth had once seen what was underneath before passing out. However, this episode led to more questions than answers for what potentially lies underneath. Kadabra, Cause and Effect Two decades ago, magician and illusionist, known for his iconic spoon-bending tricks, Yuri Geller sued Nintendo in a California court for its Kadabra Pokemon card. Like he didn't sue them for the Pokemon card, he sued them like because of the Pokemon card. Alleging that the company used his likeness to create the character. The psychic Pokemon, which is always seen holding a bent spoon, is named Younger in Japan. Essentially, you know, kind of linking him to the illusionist. And with this lawsuit coming at the height of the card game craze, Yuri had requested a halt to the creation and printing of Kadabra cards. Which which has been the reason behind the Pokemon's absence from the game to date. However, this story is one with a happy ending, as Geller may have finally come to his senses a mere 20 years later, tweeting, I'm sorry for what I did 20 years ago, but you can learn from mistakes even more than you can learn from success, allegedly lifting the ban of Kadabra card. But the Pokemon company never replied to this, nor have they slapped Kadabra's face on any shiny cardboard. So I think this is one curious case that we just might never find to be resolved. Pokemon X Special Edition A post on the r slash gaming subreddit from a user that goes by the name of Gaming Prime had showcased a very unique version of Pokemon X. And this post reads as follows. So I've been told by Nintendo's repair center that there's nothing wrong with my game. Right after they wipe 30 hours of gameplay. I present to you Pokemon X Special Edition. And that's exactly what this user did. Attaching an album of horrifying photos Photos, depicting a clearly broken and bugged out version of Pokemon X. I mean, the most obvious issue being the lack of faces. But if you thought having no face was bad, how about no back at all? Maybe a hole in the head. The character and NPC heads seem to be missing as well, with certain textures just subbed out for a black hole alternative. But after further inspection from our good personal friend Gaming Prime, this user had actually figured out that it wasn't the game at all, but instead it was a faulty 3DS. But despite the game borderline being unplayable, I still don't think that I personally would have returned this console. However, for Gaming Prime, this story has a somewhat happy ending, as it appears that they were able to get a refund or exchange for the bug console. The Mythical Eeveelutions The three legendary beasts are some of the most sought after and well received legendary Pokemon to ever grace the franchise. The trio, composed of Raikou, Entei, and Suicune, were introduced in Pokemon Gold and Silver. With lore from the games and anime, fans of the series had learned that the trio was created when the Brass Tower burned down 150 years years before Gen 2 took place, allegedly taking the lives of three unnamed Pokemon. Devastated by what had happened, Ho-Oh is said to have revived these three Pokemon and turned them into the legendaries that they are today, each one of them representing a stage of the tower's demise. Raikou, the electric Pokemon, symbolizes the lightning strike that started the fire. Entei, the fire Pokemon, symbolizes the embers that lit up the night sky. And Suicune, the water Pokemon, symbolizes the rain that eventually extinguished the flames. This has left fans to theorize over the potential matches that these three Pokemon could have been, eventually coming to the conclusion that these three dogs were actually the three original Eeveelutions prior to their untimely death. Pokemon Shock on December 16th, 1997, children across Japan crowded the TV and excitedly awaited an episode of Pokemon. However, some of the children that sat down that night never got to see the ending. Electric Soldier Porygon is one of the most widely circulated and infamous Pokemon stories worldwide. This was the 38th episode of the first season of the Pokemon anime series. This specific episode found Ash and friends teaming up with a Porygon to fix the Pokeball transfer system. Of course, defending the metaverse from Team rocket. But nearing the end of the episode, Pikachu launches an attack against an oncoming barrage of rockets, leaving quite an unruly explosion to take place. This explosion allegedly caused up to 12,000 children to experience epileptic seizures as the strobing of blue and red light was said to have caused this. This led to the episode being immediately pulled from the air and having Pokemon in general pulled from the network, remaining off air for four months. This even went as far as a full investigation into the production studio team, launched by the Otago Police Department at the discretion of Japan's National Police Agency. Nintendo shares dumped 5%, and retailers worldwide began stripping Pokemon merch off the shelves. But while this story is well known, the true numbers regarding the victims of this situation is kind of foggy. Of the 12,000 affected, it's said that only around 700 had sought medical attention, and of that 700, only 150 were admitted to hospital. Notably, 
Many of these 12,000 cases have been thought to have come due to mass hysteria brought on by the news broadcast later that night outlining the situation at hand, alerting the viewers of the potential epileptic effects while broadcasting the same clip that caused those epileptic effects. And well, obviously we should all hope for those cases to just be zero across the board. The fascinating thing behind the Porygon episode is that it wasn't just Pokemon that underwent production changes. This incident pretty much changed the entire landscape of anime and media in general. Those kind of strobe effects didn't just vanish from Pokemon, but essentially everything. And well, obviously Pokemon would go on to recover from this. This didn't stop the Pokemon Porygon from essentially getting blacklisted from all Pokemon anime and just lore in general. Recognize this on September 19th, 2020. The official Pokemon Twitter account posted and deleted a tweet that left an incredibly bad taste in many people's mouths. Although probably meant to be a harmless joke in relation to Porygon, I, I can still see why this was quickly removed. The Drifloon Reaper. On the surface, Drifloon just looks like a harmless, friendly little balloon. But maybe that's the issue that we're not addressing. Drifloon's sun entry reads that not only does it grab onto the hands of small children and drag them into the afterlife, but Drifloon also has an innate dislike for the heavier ones. It's also referenced in Heart Gold and Soul Silver that any child who mistakes a Drifloon for a balloon could end up missing. And while some Pokedex entries are just funny little descriptions leading us to develop our own lore surrounding them. This one was actually elaborated on in Pokemon Arceus or Arceus, I'm sorry, where one side quest tasks the player with helping out a child who's being held hostage by a Drifloon. So if you ask me, that's probably two we got to keep behind bars now. Giovanni jumped theory. In Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the player is able to take the special event Celebi down to Ilix Forest and duke it out with the one and only mob boss, Giovanni, at the top of Tojo Falls. And after just beating the brakes off Giovanni, he quickly sprints out of the cave. But instead of your classic, you hear a much different, Later, after the splash, Team Rocket members can be heard over the radio discussing the whereabouts of their beloved boss. When prompted, Ethan or Lyra will then answer saying that the team keeps calling their boss, expressing how they feel bad that the team doesn't know that he's not going to be returning to them. And while obviously we don't have the footage of Giovanni just hucking himself off the falls, the game does a pretty good job of pointing us in the direction of what might have happened. It's theorized that Giovanni was so distraught by his loss at the hands of a mere child that he could not not internalize what happened, and instead he just decided he would end it all. Eveltal's Doomsday Eveltal is a dark and flying type legendary that was introduced in Pokemon X and Y as one third of the Aura Trio, but while this Pokemon is visually appealing on the outside, on the inside there's a little bit more going on than we could imagine. In the Y Pokedex, Eveltal's entry reads, when its life comes to an end, it absorbs the life energy of every living thing and turns into a cocoon once more. So just in case you weren't already worried sick about the hypno trying to bust your door down and get into your child's room, now you've got the impending doom of this bird flying in front of a car on the highway and causing the cataclysm of the entire earth just hanging over you. X and Y is about life and death. Diving into this theory and piggybacking a bit off the last one, it's clear that all the Pokemon games try and follow a few common themes in each series. And that's no different with X and Y being based on DNA. But outside of DNA, the underlying theme of X and Y is life and death. Death, with our ticking time bomb Crow being labeled as the destructive Pokemon, Xerneas being listed as the life Pokemon, leaving Zygarde to represent the order, balancing these two powers and not allowing one or the other to completely take over. While Eveltal could consume the entire universe, it's also equally dangerous for Xerneas to overpopulate the world. Mega evolution is painful. It seems like throughout all these entries, we always somehow find our way back to the Pokedex. However, of all the entries that we've observed, none carry as much weight as some of these do, except like maybe the Hypno one, maybe the Drifloon one too, okay, never mind. With the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon, players had begun catching on to some rather disturbing entries in relation to Mega Evolution. I mean, for example, by asking your Caesar to evolve, you've essentially sealed its fate in the worst way possible. Its Pokedex entry reads, This Pokemon stores the excess energy from Mega Evolution, so after a long time passes, its body begins to melt. In my opinion, some of the Mega Evolution forms of Pokemon are the best 
best character models in the game. But it's hard to not feel slightly bad when you're finding out that you're actually forcing Tyranitar to split its back open. The Darkrai murder. In Pokemon Black and White, when traveling on the Marvelous Bridge, you can sometimes see the sprite of a young girl on the side of the bridge. And upon getting closer, she'll vanish, leaving the NPC beside her in shambles. And while this is weird, if you dig around the area and stumble upon this old woman sitting near the doorway, she will state that there was once a girl who always played with an Abra around here, before saying she was so full of energy. It was thought that something tragic had happened regarding this girl and her Abra, potentially having a teleportation accident take place, you know, seeing as they're playing on the side of a giant suspension bridge. But Pokemon Black and White 2 later expands on this story, unveiling a little bit more into the ghost girl. This ghost can be found in this strange house where she can be seen talking about an everlasting dark dream, searching for her mum, dad, and Abra. But eventually, upon entering in the right room in the strange house, the ghost will hand over a lunar wing, which was sort of like handing you the missing piece to solving this puzzle for yourself. The story told without being told is that the girl was murdered by Darkrai. Darkrai is mentioned within a book in the same house the ghost girl is in, and is said to have been driving people away with horrible nightmares. While on the other hand, it's said that Chrysalia is to drive nightmares away with her crescent moon lit wings, leaving us to fill in the blanks that after getting trapped in a never ending nightmare, the girl couldn't find Cresselia in time to escape, and in turn, well, died. Coughing in the wrong places. Coughing is well known as a friendly and funny little fella. The poisonous gas Pokemon introduced in Gen 1 has always been well received. So really, how bad could coughing's entry be? Well, it's, uh... It's certainly not great. Naturally, people had been upset when a screenshot was released depicting coughing hanging out in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. This image sort of blew up for, you know, obvious reasons. Although the legitimacy of this image in front of us has been debated and could very well just be some Twitter prankster with a horrible taste in humor as per usual. But according to an article from the Washington Post, the museum had been marked as a Pokestop alongside other landmarks. The communications director of the museum had stated that playing the game while in the museum is not appropriate whatsoever. Altogether, just a sloppy situation and we'll be moving on. The Lost Lives of Pokemon Go. The 2016 Pokemon Go craze is a time I genuinely don't think I'll ever forget. The impact this had on major cities was absolutely insane, and as someone who lives in a very rural small town, it was crazy to see even people of all ages gathered here to get down to business. Pokemon Go became so popular during its release that it had actually overtaken Twitter for monthly active users, peaking at over 250 million. But while that time was just wonderful for me and full of fond memories, it probably wasn't for the few who had been distracted out on the street staring at their phones. In a research paper titled Death by Pokemon Go, the economic and human cost of using apps while driving estimated that the app caused over 150,000 car accidents and over 250 deaths, also estimating that this this game would cost the world around two billion dollars in damages. And while these numbers are thought to just be wildly inaccurate, it still gives a glimpse into the potential of what this game had actually cost humanity. The Chance of Mourning In early 2020, source code from both Pokemon Pearl and Diamond were leaked online. And unlike the Space World demo, this dump was full of some... I don't know, much weirder code. Hidden within the code base were certain dates regarding various tragedies that have impacted the world. And to showcase what horrible events these were, Pokemon decided that they would decrease spawn rates by 10% on those days. I have no idea what the actual aim was behind this. It's been theorized the decrease in spawn rate was to discourage players from playing the game on days of mourning, but a 10% decrease honestly wouldn't have even made a dent in the overall spawn. If anyone knows anything more about this, please please comment and tell me. The Burger King Recall. If you're one of the now grown children like myself who used to collect every Pokemon item that ever surfaced at Burger King, then you should consider yourself lucky to even be alive today. With the launch of Pokemon the first movie, and as part of a $22 million promotion strategy for this movie, Burger King began including small Pokeball capsules with Pokemon toys inside each of their kids' meals. The promotion was a massive success, and within 10 days of the initial launch, Burger King had to release multiple apologies for the shortage of toys, 
And while everyone seemed happy, about a month into the promotion is when things started to take a turn for the worst, as a child had been found dead with pieces of the ball covering their nose and mouth. Although Burger King had argued that the promo toy had passed rigorous safety tests, the Consumer Product Safety Commission had urged Burger King to put a recall in place to stop this before it became a serious problem. However, Burger King pushed back and decided to await an autopsy to confirm that the ball was the cause of the death before issuing a recall. They didn't want to spend time and money scaring their consumers if for whatever reason, this wasn't actually caused by the toy. I mean, come on, we all know how kind and caring these big corporations are. They care about your health. But as weeks had gone by from the initial incident, it was no longer just one victim, as a father had found his infant child with the Pokeball clamped around the child's nose and mouth, but this time was able to remove it in time before the situation had escalated. But this was ultimately the straw that broke the camel's back, and Burger King had finally put a strategy into place to begin the recall. But before they could, this story leaked to the press and it exploded. Burger King is recalling millions of Pokemon balls after a baby playing with one dies. Elizabeth Bermudez shows us what makes the toys dangerous. This was not only a massive dent in the reputation of Burger King, but also a very dark area in the Pokemon franchise. But hey, no need to worry about all those silly little deaths. If you return your Pokeball to the nearest Burger King, you can get a free small fries. And with that, folks, I'd like to say thank you so much for making it this far. And if you did, please leave a comment and let me know because I can't even put into words how much I actually appreciate it.